We left off at about verse 9 last time. And just like the overall introduction is important to the book, chapter 1 is vital to the book of Revelation. A misunderstanding of chapter 1 and you're off course the whole book. So it's very important to understand that this revelation that John is receiving on Patmos uh, was done in signs. Do you have the word signified circled in the first verse in your Bible? That is so important to the understanding of this whole book. Uh, it was signified, and not only that, the things that were going to happen would shortly take place. Shortly take place. Jesus Christ is giving this revelation to John, and he was told to write it in a book, and he was going to bear witness on Patmos to the Word of God. It's, that, that's an interesting statement. It should be very interesting to us. Why he was on Patmos. Most people would say, well, the reason why he was on Patmos is because the mission exiled him there. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that Jesus was on the cross because the Romans put him there? No. <laughs> that was in the eternal purpose of God, right? The Father didn't cause it. The Father allowed it, and the Father worked it in his will to bring... You know, it's interesting. The world's greatest crime, right? The world's greatest tragedy. God brought the world's greatest good from that tragedy. What do you suppose he does in our lives? And we ask, you know, somebody that we're going to talk about having a personal relationship with the Lord next hour. Having a personal relationship with the Lord. You know, if we have that, you know what question that would preclude? <clears throat> Why me? Why is this happening to me? If I, if I am in the Word and I, and I have this personal relationship with the Lord, I will ask the question, why is this happening to me? Because if I have a close personal relationship with the Lord, I understand that things are going to happen that I don't understand, that are negative in my mind, but the Lord will bring ultimate good from those situations. John was not on Patmos because primarily the mission put him there. Paul and Silas were not in prison because the Roman government put them there or because the Jews stirred up enough controversy to get the Romans to put them there. It's not why. The Lord wasn't on the cross because Pilate condemned him there. So there's, you know, the Lord didn't ask, Father, did you read this in John 17 anywhere? Father, why me? Do you hear Paul saying while he's in prison, Lord, why me? Oh, he wants out. The Lord wanted the cup to pass from him. But they're not asking why me. Because they had a personal relationship with the Father. They, under they understood this. And so John is on Patmos for the Word of God. We go through our trials for the Word of God, for the glory of God. He was there for the Word of God, the Bible says, and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Why are we in this world? It's for the testimony of Jesus Christ. We're to testify what God has done for us. And so that's why John was on Patmos, uh, giving this message, this amazing message, to Christians who were suffering intently. John is writing this to the complete church, to the seven churches, and he says, grace and peace. Oh, easy for you to say, John. You know, we're, we're being burned at the stake. We're being thrown to the lions. You mean there's a grace and peace that can, that can beat that? Yeah. It's louder than the lion's roar. It's fiercer 
Then the tempter's sword. It's greater than all things of a material nature. Grace and peace, watch this, from him who is and was and who is to come. When you see, you'll see that phrase throughout the book of Revelation. What is it, what's the first thing you should think of? When that's referred to Jesus Christ, who was, who is, and who is to come. That's God. That's deity. There's no one else like that. You know, when people say, I believe, you know, I know a lot of people who say they believe in God, but they will say, and I mean, just be right out in the open with this. Yes, I believe in God, but I don't believe in this part of the scripture. Doesn't that sound weird to your ears? And what they're trying to do, they're trying to erect a God of convenience. They're not conforming their thinking to God's. They're trying to get God to think like them. You know, I'm going to accept what the Word says as long as it doesn't interfere with what I already think. But when we acknowledge God, it is imperative, and we'll see this later, it's imperative that we acknowledge His will. You can't separate the two. So John is on Patmos no matter what his condition was. To give the revelation of him who was, who is, and who is to come. And it's interesting, when you think of the outline of the book of Revelation, Revelation, is, Revelation chapter 1 is who was. Revelation chapters 2 and 3 is who is. And chapters 4 through 22 is what's to come. I don't think that's any of little significance. And so he is there, John is there, to give the testimony of Jesus Christ, and this is his testimony. He's the first born from the dead. What does that mean? He wasn't the first one to rise from the dead, was he? Didn't he raise Lazarus? To live eternally. Yeah. Yes, to live and to never die again. <laughs> And so he has the keys, as we're going to see later in this chapter, to Hades in death. Listen, have you ever gone home and you thought you had your keys and you didn't, but your spouse did? You know, you thought maybe he or she didn't. And you thought you had the keys. Oh, I had the key. Listen, we take comfort in someone who has a key. If God has a key to death and Hades, and what is Hades? Nobody better say hell. What is Hades? Okay, the place of the dead. What else? The place of disembodied spirits. The unseen. What's the Hebrew equivalent in the Old Testament? Sheol. Sheol. Okay, our spirits leave the body, right? That's, that's death. Separation of the spirit from the body. It goes into the Hadean world, consisting of two compartments. Don put it up on the chart. What were those two compartments? Paradise. Paradise and? Go ahead. This is one we don't, uh, we don't say too often because it was translated as hell and in our translation, what, but it's not. Yeah, it's called Tartarus. Peter talks about the uh, the devil, his angels, who are awaiting in chains of darkness. Well, what are they awaiting? They're awaiting judgment. They're awaiting the second coming. It's the place where people die and go who whose destiny is in hell. But Hades is paradise and Tartarus. The waiting places. Jesus has the key to that place called Hades. What do you do with the key? Yeah, you open it. You're the owner of it. You have control of it. And so, to these people who are suffering, Jesus is saying, I have the key to death and Hades. Stick, stick with me. That's the idea. And so he says, he continues to say in verse 5, that uh, this one who is, and, or who was, is, and forever will be, 
the firstborn from the dead. He's the ruler over the kings of the earth. It was important for these people to know that the Lord was more powerful than Domitian, who was putting them to death. Therefore, there's something more significant than physical death. People that don't have a personal relationship with the Lord think that death is the worst thing that can happen. What is the principle we learned from the very beginning? Physical death is release. Physical death is not the worst thing that can happen to you. Spiritual death is. In fact, he has the key to death in Hades. Blessed are those who die in the Lord. That is a time of great freedom, of great reunion, of great resolve. See? Because that's why we live. Now, how is John going to open up this testimony of Jesus Christ and open up for the Word of God? It's interesting what his what his what, what the very first idea is here. You ready? To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's the most significant thing you live for. And to make sure that that blood keeps on being applied. If it is, then you have a personal relationship with the Lord that can shut the lion's mouths. Oh, that doesn't mean we won't be persecuted. That doesn't mean we won't die. But it's important to have the relationship with the one who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And that's only one. And that's the Lord of the Lord and the King of Kings. And he's made us, verse 6, to be kings and priests. And priests. Who's John writing to? He's writing to Christians. He's not writing to a sect of the church that is holier than the rest. A priest. Well, we've really botched that idea up and quote Christianity, haven't we? Christians, all Christians who have this relationship with the Lord are priests, are saints. You know, it's not a matter of how many good works you do in this life that determines whether you're a saint or not. It matters if you've been washed from your sins in his own blood as to whether or not you are a priest or a saint. All right. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Watch this. Verse 7. I think this is how we're going to Behold, he is coming with the clouds. Do you remember what the Lord told the apostles in Acts chapter 1, around verse 10, when he ascended? What did the angels say? So why are you standing here looking at the Now, why are you standing here gawking up in the clouds? Yeah. The Lord Jesus is going to come again as you have seen him what? Go. In the clouds. John is reiterating that. Behold, he says what? This coming is going to be somewhat secretive. He's going to come around 1914 and not everybody's going to see him. <laughs> you know, a prominent religion teaches that today. Every eye will see him. This is so important. Why is it so important? The futuristic approach to the book of Revelation, which presumes what? It presumes a lot of things. Name one. The fu what is the futuristic approach to the book of Revelation? It says that the things in the book are yet. Yeah, it wasn't hard, was it? It's future. That's the futuristic approach to Revelation. In other words, the kingdom's not here. It's going to be established later. In fact, it's going to be established after 1,007 years. What's that mean? How long is the millennial kingdom? 
supposedly. A thousand years. A thousand year reign of Christ. You've heard of that. Plus the seven years of the rapture make a total of what? A thousand seven years between the resurrection of the just and the resurrection of the evil. The futuristic approach to Revelation doesn't believe there's one general resurrection as the Lord taught in John chapter 5. Some are going to be resurrected unto life. Some are going to be resurrected unto death. But it's going to happen at the same time. The futurist says there's a thousand and seven years between two resurrections. And not every eye, the evil eye that's already died, is not going to see him at the same time that the saint sees him that's already dead. But when the Lord comes back and the general resurrection of all people happen, John is saying, how many eyes will see him? That means the dead have to see him at the same time. Every eye is going to see him then. When he comes back. And I don't think we've made that point since we've talked. So here's another passage that does away with futurism. As far as the book of Revelation goes. Behold, in every eye he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Here's the, even those that, pers that pierced him. Those are those that actually struck him. They're going to see him. Not according to the futurists, not then. The Lord's going to have to reign a thousand years before all that happens. <laughs> Every knee will bow, too. That's exactly right. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Sometimes we sing, there's a, you know, there's a great day coming, and then the last verse, there's a sad day coming. Well, that, this might be where that song was taken. All the earth will mourn when the Lord comes. Not as saints, but for the most part, that's what's going to happen. And they're going to mourn because of him. Do you mean the Lord caused those people to be lost? We've got to understand what this phrase means throughout Scripture. This is the idea that the Lord hardened their hearts, right? Not that the Lord took away free will, but sometimes the gospel repels. How many times have you presented the gospel to somebody and they didn't want any part of it? Too many demands, too hard, whatever, whatever the deal was. What about that passage that says that God will send a strong delusion that they might believe a lie oh, that's, right. that's right. And sometimes, and how does he do that? He does that through the gospel. Oh, I just can't understand, you know, why I need to, you know. You mean I can't live with that spouse that I love a whole lot? Even though I have no right to her or him? The Lord expects me to be unhappy? The Lord didn't come and die for your happiness. He came and died for your holiness. To make you a saint, to make you a priest, to make you like him. Do you mean the Lord really expects me to tell my neighbor about, about him? Yeah, he really expects that. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I, you know, I am... I, the, the whole world consists, Colossians chapter 1, in me. You know, I, I, by rights of creation, that, that's why I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. I'm the eternal one. I'm the great I am. And because he is, then what he says goes. But it's for our benefit. He is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. John, both your brother. Our brother, John. Brother in the flesh? No. Brother ethnically? No. Spiritually in the kingdom. 
do you mean to tell me that John was in the kingdom with his brothers and sisters on Patmos? Wait a minute, the kingdom's not here yet. It's not coming until the Lord comes again. Is what we're told by the Protestant and the community church world masses. It's amazing. This is a relatively new doctrine. It's amazing how much steam it's taken up. And how, what was the, the movie series? Left Behind. Yes, 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 yes. Left Behind. <laughs> How popular that became and how interesting the rapture is. And, you know, cars being left driverless, all this stuff. Well, you can sell a good story no matter how true it is, can't you? Spiritual fiction. John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation. Boy, no matter what it is about the book of Revelation, it's been taken and it's been uh, embellished to make a good story. The tribulation. The tribulation. Guess, guess when the tribulation is? It was then and it's now. Guess when the battle of Armageddon is? It was then and it's now. It's not yet future. It's not physical. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We do that in the battle of Armageddon, in the kingdom which are now. But that, to some minds, doesn't make as fantastic a story of saying it's not now, it's later. <sighs> Patience, verse 9. Companion in tribulation and the kingdom. And don't forget this little thing. If you're going to be in the kingdom, you're going to have to be a patient person. You know, it's interesting. When we confess our faults one to another, we don't confess most of them. We all confess that we're not as patient as we should be. I think that sin has probably been confessed to me more than any other. You know, I'm just not as patient as I should be. I need to develop more patience. Well, I'm not going to question that at all. I will, I will accept that. But patience is, is part of it. Many times the word long-suffering is synonymously used in the New Testament with patience. Good word. Good word. Patience means endurance. It means long. It means, right? Love is what? Asia. It's not easily what? <coughs> oh, he offended me. Uh -huh. Oh, he offended me. Well, if you love your brother, you're not easily offended. If he didn't speak to you, then you go speak to him. And that's not a biblical offense either. What's a biblical offense? Doesn't mean it made me mad. Fault. Yeah, you caused that this person caused you to be lost. If, if uh, whoever offends one of these little ones, that doesn't mean make him mad. Whoever offends one of these little ones would be better than a millstone be hung around his neck and be cast in the sea. Why? That offense was causing the, the, the little ones to be lost. See, biblical words don't always mean how we define them in the 21st century. Or how the religious world in general defines them. And usually it's not even close. <coughs> Patience. We need to have patience in the kingdom. And John needed it while he was on the Isle of Patmos, right? For the word of God and for the testament of the Lord. Okay, here we go. I was in the spirit in the Lord's day. I had to go back and I saw how many, you know, I, you know, there's a way in which I like to consult commentaries and what, different people think, and there's a way that I don't like to do it. And if you've ever done this enough, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because you know before you go in, they're all going to disagree. You, all, you're, you know before you go in that you're not going to get a consensus. You know going, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah, let's, let's count heads. Let's see who believes what. You know, and the Lord doesn't want us doing that anyway, right? 
Doesn't matter what the majority believes, it never did. But I did that. I did that with this verse. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. All right. And I did it for two reasons. What's the meaning of the Spirit here? Is it the Holy Spirit or the human spirit? All, but it's a capital letter. That doesn't necessarily mean anything in our English translation. <coughs> and the Lord's Day, and what was it? You know, Irenaeus, one of the early, early, early church. What do you want me to call them? You want me to call them fathers? All right. But I'm not violating Matthew 23. All right. Those guys that lived either, like Polycarp, who actually lived with John, Irenaeus was his follower. Irenaeus was Polycarp's, Polycarp's follower. So he's a second generation church father. Little left. Guess what he called the first day of the week? The Lord's Day. I know there's some argumentation about whether the Lord's Day here refers to Sunday or not. I believe that all of the evidence points to the fact that it is. But I will not divide the fellowship over it at all. Doesn't take away from the meaning of it, really. He was in the spirit. Now, this is this idea of being in the spirit. See, there are so many ways and so many contexts that the spirit works. If this be the Holy Spirit, and many believe that. Then he was under the Spirit's influence, which he was, right? The Holy Spirit is the one that inspires the word to be written, even if you're, you know, seeing a panoramic play. It's the Holy Spirit that does that. There's no doubt that happened. Is that what this is saying? Okay. Yeah, could be. What about his own spirit? You know, when we come to worship, we're to worship how? Yeah, we're to be in the store to be in the proper spirit. He had to be in that spirit to write down what he was writing down. He had to be in a proper spirit as he was, you know, at the Fox Theater on Patmos and watching this play. He was in the spirit of the Lord's day. He wanted to be in worship with his brethren 70 miles away in Ephesus and he couldn't be there. And I bet John didn't say, well, do I have to be there? I bet he wished for a Sunday night service that he could attend and wouldn't have to say, do I have to go? Oh. He was in the spirit. He had the right mind. He wanted to be with them. I can't be with you, brethren, as you're worshiping. I'm kind of all tied up. But I've got a great message for you. You're going to like this one. No, I'm not going to write about Hitler and Mussolini and Iran and all of that. I'm going, to, I'm going to write to you of things that will shortly come to pass. And you're not going to receive this by me from my mouth because I can't get there. But I'm going to write it in a book. And the Holy Spirit is going to preserve it to where many will be able to read it. And those that read it and apply it will receive a blessing. He was in the Spirit. That's the Spirit we ought to have. About God's Word, about God's worship, about God's whatever. In the Spirit. When we're in the Spirit, we're in God, aren't we? Aren't the Holy Spirit and God and Jesus one God? Yes. Yeah. You know, you mentioned that we're to confess our faults one to another. 
we need to remember too that we're we're not without a high priest. Jesus Christ is our high priest. I can go to him and confess my sin. If it's a private sin, I can confess to him, and he he knows that. I don't, I don't think I don't think confess one every sin to somebody else. I don't think one excludes the other. I think we're bound to do both. Right? That's what the Bible says. You want to decide which ones you do that and which ones, you know. The only thing I know is that we're to confess our sins to the high priest and we're to confess our sins to one another. Period. He'll treat it right if you confess it to him. Pardon me? I said he'll treat it right if you confess it to Christ. And he'll bless us when we confess it to each other as well. Both. Our commandment. And so here he's on, on Patmos. He's in the spirit of the Lord's day. And the first thing that happens is that he hears a trumpet. When you see the word trumpet in figurative language, what do you think about? Do you think of a literal horn that is being blown? When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. Have you ever sung that? The trumpet, the last trump is going to sound. Literal or figurative? I don't know. It's something that's loud and sounding. And clear. In figurative language, that's what it means. It's attention getting. The trumpet, right? When a bugler sounds reveille, what's he saying? Get out of bed. Get out of bed. Get out of the sack, man. It's time to go. The trumpet sounding. The first thing that John hears during this play is the sounding of the trumpet. All right? Pay attention. And when he uses the word beginning in verse 7, behold. Listen. In English, that doesn't have as much significance as this word does in Greek. <clears throat> behold means like a big slap in the face. Pay attention. It means much more than we're used to behold. Behold. This is big time. Pay attention. That's what a trumpet does. I heard behind me a loud voice. Oh boy. Was it a trumpet? When you see the word like or as, especially in figurative language, what should be the first thing in your mind? This isn't literal. Like as a trumpet. The Spirit of God descended on Jesus at his baptism like as a dove. Those words are important. Like as of a trumpet. Saying, and it's repeated, I'm the beginning and the end. Alpha, that's the first, you know, that's the first letter of the Greek alphabet. No, maybe it's the last letter. And what you see, write in a book. Huh. Why do you suppose that here, Jesus, right? He's giving the revelation. Wants John to write it in a book. What are some other biblical principles that would tip us off to the idea that God would want inspiration written in a book? Why is that? Have you ever run into somebody who feels the spirit moving and they've got a message of the Lord for you? And it's not in a book? That's what religion-dom is divided on. Mainly what's not written. Because you know, they believe many times that the prophecy of the scripture can be of private origin, like on somebody's bed at night. Giving us a message that we're to put our eternal souls in subjection to. Hey, the Lord laid this on my heart last night. The Lord didn't lay any of his will on your heart that you haven't either already seen in his will, heard in his will, or read in his will. Nobody. That's why John wants this written in a book. You know, all the treaties that's ever been written by nations through the years, they all have been what? 
Every last will and testament of an individual has always been what? Written down. Why? Yeah. So after the loved one goes, the ones that are left are bickering over who gets what. And we have God's spiritual children after the Lord's last will and testament has been written, bickering about their way and who gets what. So John is told to write it in a book. And that's not even going to preclude all of the arguments about it, right? But if it's not written in a book, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. How do we go to Jesus? Well, we're not going to get in the car after services and run a few miles and go to Jesus. We don't go to Jesus just in our own subjective feelings and minds and, oh, I've got a personal relationship with Jesus now because that's comforting to me and I want one. That's not the basis upon which we're born again, are a Christian, have a personal relationship with the Lord. That's not. We're going to look at John 17, the next hour, and see how one has a personal relationship. But it's all about his word. And his word is all about his book. So John, this is going to be a fantastic figure to story. And there are going to be people, you know, in 2019 in Woodstock, Georgia, that aren't going to be used to all of this figurative language stuff. And they're going to ask, like the apostles did, you know, Lord, why are you speaking in figures? Why don't you just give it to us plain? Write this in a book. And I want you to write it in a book, and you don't have to be worried about what has already been read in inspiration and the correlation of all that. The Holy Spirit will take care of that, how there won't be any errors in it, and how what you write compared to what Daniel and Ezekiel wrote hundreds and centuries ago, how that's all going to come together in a book. And that's why Jesus said heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. That's why nobody could kill it yet. There's never been a book that's undergone more scrutiny and more persecution than this one, yet it remains the world's bestseller. Why? Pray to God it's the world's most studied, but it's not. But it's still the best. Why? Because no one's going to be able to say to God, well, God, you know, you didn't make your word accessible. You didn't tell me when the kingdom was going to come. No one's going to be able to say that. Write it in a book. Write it in a book. And you will be divinely guided to write it just the way God intended it. And what you write in a book, I'm going to call it my word. I'm going to take your imperfections. I'll make perfection of it. It sounds like our lives. Even our sins. God can use those. If we let him. John write this in a book. And send it. To the complete church. The complete church is going to get this. There's not going to be. It's not just going to seven. It's going to go. It's going to go to every church of Christ. From the first century. Do you know of any church that didn't have the book of Revelation? I know some churches that prefer not to study the book of Revelation. Or kind of step back from it. So they didn't think it could be understood. But if they just studied a little bit, they could they'd reject that conclusion. Send it to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, we get detailed here, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Seven. Complete. A lampstand doesn't give light. That's not the candle. The lampstand supports the candle. And we're going to be told in the last verse of this chapter that the lampstand are the seven churches. The seven churches don't originate truth. 
It supports the truth, and that's what 1 Timothy 3.15 says. The church is the pillar and ground of the what? Of the truth. That's what a lampstand does. If this is a faithful church, it's not... This is not my church. It's not your church. It's not what the church of Christ believes. That's not the important thing. The important thing is that the church of Christ supports the truth. That we're the lampstand. The seven churches are the lampstand. The complete church that are faithful in Christ. We're the lampstand. We're not the candle. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, in the midst of the seven churches, the complete church, not seven churches teaching different things, but the complete one church in different congregations, one, what's in the middle of the church? One, what's that next word? You better ever look at it. Like. What's the word mean in figurative language? Yeah. It's called a simile. It's a simile. In hermeneutics, you talk about figures of speech. You know, you have synecdoche and, and, and dichotomies. You've got all kinds of, uh, of figures of speech. Well, simile is a figure of speech. And when you see the word like or as, it's, a, it's something similar. Not always the literal thing. And he says here... One like the Son of Man. Do you know that Jesus, when he was on the earth, referred to himself as the Son of Man 50 times? Many more times than he referred to himself as the Son of God. I wonder why. I don't know. Maybe it was because he wanted to make sure that we could relate to him. And that he was the perfect savior by the things that he suffered like we do. And he was tempted in all points like we are. And maybe that's why he used the, the phrase son of man many more times than the son of God. Now it's interesting. When people referred to him, many more times they referred to him as the son of God. Whether in, uh, with good motives or not so good. Oh, you call yourself the son of God. You know, that kind of thing. Many others refer to him as a son, but he referred to himself more as a son of man. Fifty times. And more so in the books that were written to pagans. Matthew was written to who? God's people, the Jews. Son of God is used more times than just in that book. But when he wrote to Romans and Greeks, Mark and Luke... Son of man, used many more times. One like the son of man, clothed with a garment to the feet. In scripture, when you think of someone clothed in a garment to the feet, who do you think of, for the most part? Yes, yes, not what I was thinking. <laughs> the priests, the priestly garb was like that. We have great depictions of the priestly garb, you know? And it was a garment that went down to the feet and girded about the chest, remember? With a golden band, his head, now this is where the, the simile may break with the high priest, his head and hair were white. In figurative language, what does white mean? Brides, what does white mean? Purity. Purity. Uh, white like wool and as white as snow, right? Unto him who loved us, washed us from our sins to make us white as snow. And we have that, we sing that figure and it's from the book of Isaiah. And his eyes like, have you underlined or circled how many times like is used in this? And people try to literalize this book. Are you kidding me? All the way through it. Like a flame of fire. A flame of fire. Knowledge and wisdom. Right? Strength. And that's what 
brass is? Penetrating, yes. Like fine brass. Brass is what? Strength? As it is re as it refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Power. Water, right? Powerful. Covering. Three fourths of the world, right? Is covered with water. So it is with the word of God. Is that the first bell or the second bell? Second. Second. I didn't hear the first one. Yeah, you weren't listening. <laughs> I never miss a bell. Yes, you did. <laughs> All right, I'll stop. The only reason I, I noticed is not that I heard any. I, I just saw people coming in. I said, wow, two bells. I missed it. All right. Thank you. Pick up there next time.